All right, welcome back to our bare bones series on sonship suffering. This is session two. We're going to continue by looking at the sixth benefit of properly responding to our sufferings. And that was going to be that it produces godly love toward our offenders. Um, it not remember one of those was that you know it changes our perspective toward the offenses themselves, but this right response will actually. And, and again, I'm not talking about an emotion. You won't feel about them like you do your kids. This is making a decision to value and esteem them the way your heavenly father does. And, and this is important. So let me give you some verses here. So Romans 12, 20, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, by the way, this is Romans, that's us, right? So we're not Romans, but I'm saying, you know, body of Christ. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt he calls the fire on his head. We covered that back in Romans 12. Romans 13, 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You say, well, I thought we weren't under the law. You do understand that Paul talks about us fulfilling the righteousness of the law without the law. The problem wasn't that the law was unrighteous. The problem was we couldn't do it. Okay, Here, he was. Thank you. He's the fulfiller. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. I want to make a point about this before we go to the next verse. There are, there are things that we learn, intellectual things. So let's just talk, let's just let's just say that there, there are things that we learn, information. I'm all for that. Your education, you have to learn it before it can work in you. So you have to know it. But here's the other thing, though. This is. I'm going to call it the application, but you, it, you could use another word for that. The things that you learn have to work in you. If all we're doing is gathering information, it doesn't matter how much you know. If, it's not, if you're not living in the way that Paul is instructing you here, if that's not what's motivating you and guiding you, there, don't, don't be surprised when there's no reward at the judgment seat of Christ. So a guy, the, the smartest guy in the world, good for him. The guy that knows the most about the Bible, good for him. I'm for that. But what I'm not for is, so if you said to me, what would you rather have? Would you rather have someone know a little bit about the Bible and they live out of what they know or would you rather have someone that knows a lot about the Bible, but they don't, but that really doesn't impact their everyday life? Well, read that verse and answer your own question. Because that explains exactly what's going on there. Number, number four here, Galatians 5, 6, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. That's it. That's it. What are we talking about? You know what? When this doctrine effectually works in you, it will change the way you're looking at the people that don't like you. I, know, I realize how people view that when I talk about the guys that really don't like me a lot. And I go, hey, they're my brothers in Christ. I, you know what? They do a lot of good stuff. We probably agree on most things. But you know what? I'm not, I'm no longer going to treat them the way I used to because I understand what that means. It means that doctrine is not working in me. And that, you know, I, I have a goal and that is to be conformed to the image of God's son. That's the goal. And people look at that and go, well, you're just scared or you're just weak or you're just, hey, Paul said the same thing to the Corinthians. Oh, yeah, you're strong. We're weak. Yeah, you're wise. We don't know anything. You remember that? Yeah, that's what I think about when I see that. Look, okay, I just don't want to go back to that. Okay, so I mean, it really doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so uh, if our response to our offenders comes out of anything other than godly love and charity, we're just not thinking about them properly. And so the good news is we don't have to hate our enemies. 
and I don't have to fire back at them and try to discredit them. In fact, if I really am, and by the way, I'm not talking about just taking the high road. I know that's the way people like to describe it. No, this is a whole different way to live. Godliness is a lifestyle. It's not a coat that you put on when it's convenient because people are watching you. Okay, so you may not think of it this way, but this is good ulcer medicine. Do you know how many people get all wound up by this? You know what? It doesn't matter. Just look at them the way that you're supposed to. Let that doctrine work and you'd produce that. Here's the next two. I put them together. It glorifies our Father and it produces the peace of God. Philippians 4, 7. Here's the verse. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When people suffer, and they are to one degree or another being overwhelmed by their circumstances, that is not God's will for them. For them to, to you know, get swept away by the things that are happening, by the adversities. And by the way, when they allow that to happen, that doesn't glorify God. He really has a provision for them to become more than conquerors in the midst of that. But if in the midst of our suffering, we have the peace of God that passeth understanding, that helps us not only endure suffering, but it helps us glorify God, how much better is that? And see, I actually believe there's a reward for that. See, I believe that here's a guy that's questioning God, and he's mad, and he's angry, and you know, he's fighting with everybody. And there's a guy over here that actually understands what God is doing in this dispensation of grace. And he decides, you know what? I want that doctrine to work in me and make me the godly man that God designed me to be. And I'm going to respond out of that. I don't think God looks at that and looks at that and goes, yeah, those look the same to me. And I don't think that. And I don't think anybody does. Okay. So here's the next two. And that is... It provides a testimony to men, and it makes an impact on the heavenly realm, and I'm talking about both good and evil. So I'm going to give you a verse for this, and this is going to be in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Now, we covered this, but I'm just going to remind you of it, for I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Now, I'm going to finish reading this, but I just want to interject right here. Because of what Paul says to the Corinthians, I don't think the apostles are the only ones that are being watched. I think the members of the body of Christ are being watched and ought to behave themselves appropriately in connection with that. Verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake. What does he say? to But you're wise in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we're despised. Even under this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked. Now think about what he just said. Under this present hour, I don't have anything to eat. I don't have anything to drink. And I don't have clothing to protect me from the elements. Now that's somebody that's talking to you when they're in the, in the, in the midst of it. And are buffeted. What does that mean? Is that like a golden corral? What is, what is that? They're getting beat up. And have no certain dwelling place. All y'all going to a home when you get through here? You're ahead of Paul. No certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands. And then look what the reward of that is. Being reviled. Paul says, we fire right back. Oh, no. No. He said, we bless. Being persecuted, yeah, we get even. No, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Paul went into this with his eyes wide open. He knew exactly what this was about, and he knows what the godly response is, and he just gave it to you. Our flesh hates that. Our flesh is conditioned by the course of this world. And you know what? There's not a movie you can go watch that will do that. Nobody's interested in that. Nobody will buy a ticket to that. 
What we want to do is see a guy wrong so he can kill everybody in as malicious a way as possible. And we look at that, and that's how we entertain ourselves. And it is any wonder that godliness is difficult for us because the world is inundating us 24 7 with every. I, I, I challenge you to do this. I did this one day. I thought, you know what, I, as I, I'm going to watch this, and when I do, I'm going to write down everything I see that violates biblical principle. Don't, don't do that, okay? If you have carpal tunnel, you, this will not end well for you. I got, I got into that, and you know what? I was pausing it. I was pausing it and going, well, okay. So he's using God's name in vain, okay. Oh, yeah, and he was shooting a guy when he did it. Okay. And you know what? And he stole the car. Okay. And then you start it up, and you go, and you know what? I mean, really, you'll get pages in, and you'll only be 15 minutes into the movie, and he will have violated every biblical principle you can think of twice. Is it any wonder that this is the mindset that we have? This is why godliness is so unappealing to people. Where's the avengement factor? You know, when am I going to, you know, where's my smart alecky response? Why don't I get to do that? You know, because vengeance belongs to the Lord, not you. You're supposed to remember who you are. You're his ambassador. People don't want to be his ambassador. Okay, that's fair. You don't, and he's not going to twist your arm over it. But don't convince yourself there's a big reward waiting for you at the end. The off-scouring of all things unto this day, do you think Paul was trying to get people to think well of him? Or was he just interested in putting godliness on display? I don't think Paul wanted people to dislike him. Now, look, I believe we also not only have an impact on men, I believe we also have an impact in the heavenly realm, just like Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I think what when we exhibit godliness, I think the good angels, the holy angels, rejoice because they do know that one day we're going to be up there and we can return righteousness to the heavens. And I think they've been waiting for that. Can I tell you this? The creature's been waiting for it. The creature groaneth and travaileth waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's waiting for us to get up there. But for Satan's realm, it, it, it's not to their encouragement, it is to their chagrin. Because now they see someone putting something on display that cannot be generated by your flesh, but is a manifest token that God is at work in you, conforming you to the image of his son. No, Christ in you. Yes, that's the mystery of godliness. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, to the encouragement of those holy angels and the regret of those evil angels, when we suffer with him, when we take pleasure in infirmities, when we rejoice in the spiritual work being done in our inner man, when we view our tribulations as opportunities to grow in grace, when our inner man is renewed day by day, even when our physical man is perishing, it not only makes a difference to us who are doing the suffering, but it makes an impact to the glory of God in the heavenly realm that we can't see with our, with our physical eyes. That's a glorious thing. Glorious thing. Okay. It conforms us to the image of God's Son. And that's Romans 8, 28. You should never read 28 without reading 29. And we know that all things work together. For, you know, the world loves this verse. And, 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 and um, there's some things I think that are not appreciated here. Because this is not an automatic thing. Have you ever had some things that happened to you that were not good? And they didn't work good in the end. Because we didn't respond to it properly. But if you do... All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. 
Now, that is going to happen to every one of us. You are going to be conformed to the image of God's Son. But it is His intention that that process start here and now. And your position in the heavenly places will be predicated upon just how much of that took place with you here. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is about. The things done in the body, not what's going to happen after you get up to the heavenly places, but the things done in the body. So we have to kind of pay attention to that. Okay, so um, here I'm going to put the next three together. So it gives us hope, a right response to our suffering through the doctrine gives us hope. It prevents despair and being overwhelmed, and it equips us to give hope to others. Now, I can talk about, well, let me just give you the verses on it. So Romans 5, 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Why, Paul? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. By the way, when we started in Thessalonians, do you remember how they were going through their sufferings? Patience and faith. Remember that? Tribulation worketh patience. Does it always? Does everybody that goes through tribulation, do they just get patience? See, he, you understand, this is not an automatic thing. Okay. Tribulation work is patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. You know what happens to people who have no hope? Terrible things happen to people that have no hope. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Boy, that's great. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Paul, Paul said, I, I don't know if we we're going to make it. This is how bad it got. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. See, th this is where Paul says, hey, stiff upper lip won't, won't do it here. What the flesh generates is not enough. But in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. The thing I want you to get out of this is the deliverance was not keeping bad things from happening to Paul. He just described it. You know what the deliverance was? From the effects of those bad things. That's the deliverance. Now, see, we don't like that one. We need, we need God to make sure bad stuff doesn't happen. But you understand, in the midst of that stuff, all things work together for good. If you're going to respond to this rightly, all, all of this can make a real difference. And now, and now let's take a look at the next part of this, 2 Corinthians 1.4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Do you know one of the advantages of being able to appropriate God's grace in the midst of your suffering so that you can become more than a conqueror and your inner man can be renewed day by day no matter what's happening on the outside? You know the advantage of that? Once you know how that works, you can tell someone else when they're in that same predicament. And that, that's valuable. And so Paul says, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Paul says, hey, what God did for me in the midst of my stuff, he can do for you in the midst of your stuff. Verse five, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Sure, the sufferings of Christ, Paul says, I've got them. Yeah, those things are happening. God's not stopping them. God's not putting his hand between me and trouble. Those things are happening, but guess what? The consolation also abounds in me so that he can say, I take pleasure in infirmities. I glory in tribulations. Verse six, and rather we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. You don't understand what he's saying right there. Paul says, I'm the, I'm the guinea pig. When, when he signed up, God says this, Everything that you need them to ha have happen, it's got to happen to you so that you know how the consolation works. And then you can 
pass that on to them. You know why that's valuable? Now I'm gonna say this, if there's anybody listening to this and they're in ministry, I'm gonna tell you, this is, this is really important. It is not enough to learn the intellectual information about how the doctrine works in you and transforms you. You have to get involved in that process before you teach it. It has to become a living reality in you. Otherwise, it's just theory. And when people have real questions about what, what's going on with this or what's going on with that, you won't have an answer for that because you haven't been through it. The real, the real test here is like Paul. Paul says, these things are happening to me so that I can really go through this and get that consolation. And once I've done that, guess what? He says, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. You see that? How great is that? Or rather we be comforted, it's for your consolation. He said, rather we be afflicted or rather we be comforted, this is all for your benefit. Because I'm showing you how to go through this. And I'm trying to say to anybody that's listening to this recording that there is something that God has provided for you out there that will allow you to go through the sufferings of life without being overcome or being made bitter or being made angry or any of those things. There is a, another way to live and that's what grace is all about. So the hope is a benefit for us, and it's also a benefit for those that we want to help. And not to mention the fact that it prevents that despair and depression and all of those kinds of things. Now, people don't automatically get hope just because they suffer, do they? And people, and, and you know what? And you don't automatically learn how to counsel someone else just because you suffered. It has to be because you've learned how to respond to that suffering by the word which is working in you. So our, our apostle is, is saying to them the same thing I think he would say to us, that the consolation he learned made those sufferings valuable to him. So does it surprise me when the Lord would say, and your joint heirs, if so be that we suffer with him? No, that, see, that doesn't surprise me at all. But I know that if you take this off and you say, just because we suffer, we get what? No, I, I, don't, I, I really don't see that. Okay, so now let me do the last one. And this is O. It provides the reward of the inheritance, which is to reign with Christ. Now, you know what I've done so far? I've given you 14 advantages of, of the doctrine being your response to suffering that helps you right here and now in your daily life, 14. Now, if you're listening to this and you're going, oh, I just can't go with that one, then, then you know what? Don't, don't preach that one. Preach the other 14. You, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. If you don't like O, A through N will do fine. But really, I do look at this and I think, there is a reward of the inheritance that is gotten because we have lived out of the doctrine. I'm going to take you back to the Second Timothy scripture. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Look, if this thing was automatic, why would he be talking about denying anybody the right to reign? Do you see that? That's what the deny is about. The de Remember I said, it's not that we deny him like, oh no, he's not my savior. We're talking about with regard to the suffering. In what way can you suffer that you would deny him? Did I erase that? But it'd be, it'd be like, why God? It'd be like whining and complaining. See, that's, that's not suffering with him. That's, that's thinking God is doing what he's supposed to do. What, what's, why, why is he doing this? Why is he, see, and he says, look, if you don't want to do that, then don't think you're going to do this. Because if that was automatic, you could wipe out everything after that colon, just leave it right there. 
somebody obviously is not going to be reigning. Does that verse connect the reigning with suffering? It's not rocket science. So I'm just saying that that is meant to help us and that is meant to make a difference in our daily lives, no matter which kind of suffering that we're talking about up there. So I would say, and so I have one last verse to read to you and we're, we're gonna end by talking about this one because the point I'm trying to make here is I, I really do think there is a reward for, and look, I do know there are folks that think there's no reward for handling the sufferings of this present time out of the doctrine. There's only reward for the sufferings of Christ. Well, let's pretend for a moment that's true. I don't think that's true because Paul mentions sufferings of Christ in the midst of all those others. But let's suppose for a moment that that's right. Would it, even if there was no reward for it, wouldn't you still want the doctrine to preserve you in the midst of these sufferings? That's all. That, 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 that's, that's where I'm going with this. That there is something available for you, and it's not just, it doesn't just work here, but, I, but it works in both places. And if we'll allow that doctrine to do that work, guess what? It'll conform you to the image of God's Son. It'll edify you. It'll build you up in the faith. It'll preserve you from being overwhelmed by your circumstance. It'll give you hope. In fact, you know what? It'll change the way you look at the things that are happening and the people that are doing them to you. It'll change all of that. And, and if you don't think there's a reward for that, then okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, so get, give you the last verse and I have a comment. So in Romans 8, 17, I said we'd come back to it at the end and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, comma, and. Anytime you see in your Bible where it has X, 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 comma, and Y, 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 these are two different things. That is, that, that is English grammar that separates things, not a repetition of saying the first thing. And this, all you have to do is follow it through your Bible. Just take a look. And when it says, we're heirs of God, comma, who is heirs of God? Well, everybody that knows the Lord, everybody that's trusted Christ as their Savior, they're an heir of God. They are. And I don't want to minimize that. that. That heirship right there is greater than anything any man has ever had on this earth. It is beyond the scope of what we have seen in the earth. That's how good that is comma, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. When I'm looking at that one is I'm saying, okay, well, that looks like a condition to me. So in the Oxford English Dictionary, I looked up the phrase, if so be. Now, why the Oxford English Dictionary? Because it says what I wanted to say? Of course, that's why. No. I'm you know what? That because here's what the Oxford English Dictionary does that other dictionaries don't do. They not they don't do away with definitions of words. They continue to add. So when you see a word or a phrase in the Oxford English Dictionary, they list the meanings of that word, beginning with the first meaning that everybody understood that it had, and then they give you a reference that you could actually go look up and see that the word was used in that way. Now, why is that important? Because if I'm looking at a word and I'm saying, this is the meaning I want to define it as I find it in my Bible, but, but the date on that word didn't come into being until 1748, what do I know? That's not what they meant here. Because when did that get translated? 1611. So that's not the meaning because that word wasn't even being. You remember a few Sundays back and I was showing you those words and I was showing you shoe. Remember? And I was saying, look, that word didn't get changed to S-H-O-W 
until after the King James was translated. Now, people see S-H-E-W and they think it's something different. So they don't want to say show. They want to say shoe. Okay, okay. But here's the thing. The other words got changed before 1611, and we use those, but that was one that didn't get changed until after 1611. So all through your Bible, it never says S-H-O-W. But where it says S-H-E-W, it means S-H-O-W. Okay? So I like the Oxford English Dictionary because it gives me all the definitions. It doesn't do away with one because it's archaic and out of usage. But if the first meaning is this. The second one that came into being is this, and on and on and on. They're giving you dates, and they're giving you references to look them up. And because of that, when I'm looking at, when I'm, when I'm looking at these words here, and I look up, if so be, do you know what the Oxford English Dictionary says when you look up the phrase, if so be? Because they understand that you can say if, and you don't mean maybe it will and maybe it won't. But you're, you're showing the certainty of something in comparison to something else. If someone says, you, you know, uh, are we going to get something to eat on the way home? And you go, if there's a store open, we're going to get something to eat. But you already know there's a store open, right? You're just saying that's how sure it is. But there's another if that says, when a kid goes, hey, can I go over to Tommy's house? And you go, if you have cleaned your room. What does that mean? That's a condition, right? That's not sure. That's, that's a condition that you have to meet. So when I looked up if, if so be as a phrase in the Oxford English Dictionary, you know what it said? If so be in the English language is always used as a conditional. And then they give you reference for it. So when I hear someone say, well, if so, D, if so be, it's not conditional. In the English language, it's always conditional. Okay, so now let me, let me, let me finish this up because I do have something important to say here. I'm not really debating the doctrine, but I am saying that I'm looking at all of this and all of this seems to fit together for me. Everything that we've talked about including down to the reward of the inheritance. And so I want to give you this last point, and it's not a proof of anything, but it is something to think about. And again, it's not a proof, but I think it's valuable to think about this. So let's suppose I am totally wrong about the joint heir inheritance, totally wrong about the adoption, and totally wrong about the suffering. Now, obviously, I don't believe I am. But let's say that I am totally wrong. And what I have convinced you folks to do is to allow that word to effectually work in you to produce a godly response to the sufferings in your life. Even if I'm wrong about a reward or any of that stuff, even if I'm wrong about that, if you, if you have allowed the word to work in you and produce the life of Christ in you, what will you lose at the judgment seat of Christ? Absolutely nothing. But if I'm right, and you're trying to say to people, don't worry about that. If you suffer, you're going to get it. My fear is they're not only not going to get the reward, but they're not going to get the benefits here and now either. They're going to miss out on both ways. Now, that's not a proof that I'm right, but I'm just, I'm just looking at it and I'm thinking, look, if I'm wrong, I haven't done you any disservice here. Because you didn't lose anything because obviously there was nothing to gain. But if there is something to gain, then we should pay attention to all these things that we've looked at in Paul's epistles and how we're supposed to respond to the sufferings in our life. Now, what this leads us to is the next section of this. I won't, I won't do it here. I'll probably do it at my desk. But the next natural question, if someone looks at all this and says, okay, okay, I see how God, you know what? He cared how Israel responded. I think he cares how we respond. I see all these benefits for us here and now. Okay, what's next? Well, what's next is how do I get that word to effectually work in me? What part of that word needs to work in me 
so that God's grace is working in me in the midst of that so I can become more than a conqueror, so I can have the consolation, so I can, I can give that hope to other people, so that I, like Paul, can take pleasure in infirmities and, re- and, and, and glory in tribulations. How do I get that working? Wouldn't that be the next logical question? So that has to be the next thing that we do. In this, in this bare bone study, that has to be the next thing that we do. And so that's what we'll do. And what I, I really want to do is once we get through with this thing, is just turn it into a book. And then people don't have to find the video. And wouldn't it be great to have some kind of a resource that when somebody's really going through a hard deal, you can just say, hey, why don't you just read that little book right there? And then if you have any questions, you know, call Francis. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I really... Look, I just, I, there are things in my mind that I just don't feel talking about, feel free to talk about on, on the recording, but there are things that are happening that make me understand that we really need this, really need this. Um, okay, so thank you for being with us in the study. This is the end of session two.